Okay, so this week's um, lecture is going to be um, on the hydrosphere. So we're going to be taking a look at um, each component of the Earth system, um, because remember, the Earth is a, is a system. Um, and so we're going to be looking at each component of the Earth system separately to kind of understand how they work, um, to get both, both together and, and independently. And then we're going to be able to take that information and then start thinking about, um, wh what it means, uh, for the climate to be changing, uh, what impact humans have on that, um, etc etc right so so we're going to take our information and our knowledge of the earth as a system and then we're going to translate that to be able to talk about uh contemporary climate change um as we've observed it in the 20th and the 21st centuries um and we'll also be talking a bit about earth's um historical climate as well um and and um whether there are analogs whether there are are parallels between between Earth's uh, uh, historical climate and climate change, and then the current climate change that we're experiencing. So let's start talking about the hydrosphere. So as the name suggests, the hydrosphere is everything on Earth that's water. So liquid water, ice water, um, and water vapor. Okay. So liquid water, of course, uh, we, see, we can see it on the Earth's surface. We can see it falling out of clouds as rain. Ice uh, water, we can also see that in the form of snow and glaciers and um, icebergs and um, ice caps and, and, and stuff like that. Water vapor is invisible. We can't see it, but we feel it when it's really humid. Um, and so those components of the Earth system make up the hydrosphere, which is all of the stuff on Earth that's water. So what are some of the major components of the hydrologic cycle, right? So I think we're all sort of kind of familiar with this type of graphic where you've got water that evaporates, for example, off of the ocean, okay? And then when it gets high enough in the atmosphere, it condenses into a cloud. Um, it's transported around. Sometimes those clouds rain in the form of precipitation, like uh, snow, rain, fog, uh, mist, etc. When that rain uh, or that snow hits the ground, it can infiltrate and percolate down into what we call the groundwater um, or, or subsurface flow of water, where it can then move uh, underground into lakes, into rivers, into the ocean. Um, and kind of repeat the hydrologic cycle again. Um, there's also a thing called sublimation, which is um, snow. Instead of melting, it goes straight from snow as a solid, right, to water vapor as a gas, and that's a process known as sublimation, or deposition is the opposite of that. Those are, are, are fairly uncommon in everyday, our everyday experience, unless you live at the top of like a very cold mountain, or it's super cold here in the winter, like below zero and there's snow on the ground. That can happen. So where is Earth's water? What are the major reservoirs of water? I know that most of us know that most of the water is, of course, in the ocean. I don't know that everyone knew, perhaps, that 97% or 96.5% of all the water on Earth is in the ocean. Um, so this is, if we're thinking in terms of the human experience, um, this ocean water is, is inaccessible to us as humans um, because uh, it's salty and we can't drink salt water. So we can only access the fresh water on Earth, um, which makes up about 2.5% uh, or 3% of all the water on Earth is fresh water. If I look at that fresh water uh, little slice there and I expand it out, Almost 70% of all the fresh water is in glaciers and ice caps, okay, so it's frozen. 30% um, or so of it is in the ground, and another 1% of it is on the surface in lakes and rivers and streams, um, or ground ice, okay, permafrost, right? So we have lakes and we have rivers and 
living things and, and, and ground ice and permafrost, these sorts of things on the surface. Excuse me. So you can see that even among of the of the two or three percent of fresh water that's available to humans to consume, um, seventy percent of that is actually locked up in glaciers and ice caps. So the amount of of all the water on Earth that's that we can actually access uh, to, to to drink um, or to water our crops or whatever is uh, is very small percentage. Maybe one percent of all the water on Earth is something that. Is water that humans can access for for to keep us alive. So we're going to first talk about uh, probably the most apparent, visible, obvious um, form of fresh water. So we're going to start talking about fresh water, and then the next lecture is going to be on oceans. Um, so one of the most sort of obvious and apparent uh, manifestations of fresh water is in rivers. <clears throat> rivers are Hugely important for throughout human history, not because they provide us a source of drinking water, but they also serve as a mode of transportation. We can travel up and down rivers to trade goods and 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 um, and move things around. We can also hunt in rivers or fish in rivers, hunt around rivers or fish in rivers. So rivers and river river systems um, have a deeply historical uh, connection with the human experience on earth and so we're going to start by talking about rivers in this in this hydro hydrology section and we're going to move from rivers um, we're going to talk about lakes a little bit and then groundwater and then the next um, lecture will be on oceans so rivers um, are a system right they usually begin with melting snow and and water in the mountains that melting snow can form swamps it can form small streams eventually they find their way down in elevation uh, where they collect in swamps and, and ponds and lakes and some of that water infiltrates and becomes groundwater which then flows under the ground near the river. You have a stream which is joined by other streams and tributaries um, which eventually become what we might call a river. So it's all a system. And that system is something known as a drainage basin. Let me just move myself out of the way here. A drainage basin okay, is a, a piece of land, okay, an area of land where all of the water, kind of that's 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 part of that piece of land, flows into the same uh, river or exit point. Okay, so if this is a a piece of land, okay, this is the the edge where all the water is sort of flowing into. Okay, so this is the drainage basin for this point, which means all the water that falls in here is eventually going to find its way either into the groundwater or into streams or tributaries. Um, they're going to all find their way kind of down into the the main river and at this point every all the water that's arriving at this point okay is coming from within this drainage basin. This is a different drainage basin so water that lands over here is going to come out at this point water that lands over here is going to come out at this point, okay? So this division between the two drainage basins is called the divide. So the divide divides the two drainage basins. Drainage basins can be any scale that you want. You choose one point at the, the exit point of the drainage basin and you can track back and figure out where all the water that's arriving at that singular point is coming from and that is the drainage basin. So here's an example of a drainage basin for the Lotru River. Okay, so the Lotru River right here is receiving all of its water in this drainage basin. Uh, oh sorry, this is for the, the Lotaricha River which is a tributary of the Lotru River. Um, so this is the drainage basin for this smaller Lotaricha River. Okay, um, and you can see all of this inside of the red line is in the drainage basin for this river. So all of the water that's in there, falling on there from rain clouds, melting in there from snow, etc., etc., is making its way into the Lotaricha River at this point from this drainage basin. So that's the drainage basin. And then this red line represents the divide, which divides that drainage basin from other drainage basins. 
if we scale up these drainage basins, right? So again, drainage basins can be can be all scales. They can be very small streams, or they can be continental scale drainage basins. And if we scale up drainage basins to to continental scale, this is what the map looks like. These are all of sort of the divine div defined large drainage basins uh, by the major body of water that they're draining into. So for example, here we have the, uh, they're calling it the American Mediterranean Sea, but it's basically the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. Okay, the drainage basin for that sea is coming from within this yellow region. And these gray lines represent the divides. For the Indian Ocean, the drainage basin for the Indian Ocean, right, is all of this pink. So everything in this pink is draining into the Indian Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is everything here in purple. The Arctic Ocean, uh, the, 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 they're calling this the Eurafrican Mediterranean Sea, which is this region in here. We just call it the Mediterranean. You have the Atlantic, um, and you have the Southern Ocean. Okay, so these are all different drainage basins, continental scale drainage basins. If we zoom in on just North America, um, we can uh, divide the entire continent into several drainage basins, several like slightly more specified drainage basins. Um, so we have the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea, which is defined by this drainage basin here. So everything that falls... Um, west of this red line, south and of this green and pink line, and, and uh, sorry, east of the red line, south of the green and pink line, and west of the orange line is going to ultimately drain into the Gulf of Mexico. So that's the Gulf of Mexico drainage basin. Okay, one of the major rivers that's draining here is the Mississippi River. Okay, we also have um, uh, a drainage basin that drain a drainage basin that's draining into Hudson Bay. Uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean, okay? And all of these lines represent the divides. So the divides, um, when they're at a continental scale, are called continental divides. And I'm, if you've ever driven in the West, Western United States, specifically on, on I-70 through Colorado, for example, you drive over the Great Continental Divide which is the continental divide that runs all the way from the Chukchi Sea down into the southern tip of Mexico, okay? This is a large continental divide, the Great Continental Divide. You'll notice that we also have a divide that runs very close to Chicago, um, which may surprise you since it is so flat here, um, but there is a continental divide uh, where it's this pink line here, where rain and water and snow and stuff that, that falls east of that is going to drain into the Great Lakes, which ultimately drain out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, okay, on the St. Lawrence River. Anything that falls to the west of that continental divide is going to drain ultimately into the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico, okay? So this continental divide is... Uh, barely visible. If you go to Oak Park, you can see it. It's barely visible. Um, but it is real and exists. And historically, all the rain that fell east of that continental divide, which would include the whole city of Chicago, drains into, for example, Lake Michigan, which then drains into the St. Lawrence River and out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence here by Newfoundland. And all the rain that falls to the west of it, so in the suburbs and west, would ultimately drain into the Des Plaines River and then, and then into the Mississippi River. Okay, so this is a continental divide. So your group work today, um, which I will we'll talk about tomorrow when we meet at the Zoom, um, will be thinking about large river drainage basins across the globe. So, um, and then and, and creating sort of a little um, historical... Uh, not a historical, an informational PowerPoint presentation on some of the major uh, rivers systems and river drainage basins in the world. But just thinking about some of the largest by area and by volume, for both by area and by volume, the Amazon is the largest drainage basin in the world. The Amazon River in South America is 
is huge. There's a ton of water by volume, right? And it takes up a large area. It's almost the entire continent of South America. So it is both the largest by area and the largest by volume. Then things diverge a little. Um, the Rio de la Plata in Argentina, the Congo, the Nile, and the Mississippi round out the top five large drainage basins by area. But when you look at by volume, meaning how much actual water is in that drainage basin system, the Ganges or the Ganja River in uh, India and Bangladesh um, is number two, and then the Congo River in Central Africa um, is number three. So the Congo River um, drainage basin is also one of the largest by area. Um, it's actually a very short river, however. Um, it's not nearly one of the longest rivers in the world, but that doesn't matter when it comes to how much water and how much area that whole drainage basin takes up. So this is going to be your group work, and I'll leave this uh, image up for a second so that you can kind of pause the video and write this stuff down, but I'm going to break you up tomorrow into groups of three to four so that we have about five or six groups, and I will assign you each a river system, um, a drainage basin, so the, Am the Amazon or the Nile or the Congo or the Ganges or the Mississippi or the Yangtze. Um, and you will be responsible for creating in your group a short three-minute three minute presentation which you'll then present to the class next time or you can record um, using QuickTime or Zoom or whatever you want on the river system that you are assigned. And you must include these six points in your presentation of the river. The first one is the volume that the river drains, the volume of water, the total volume of water, the total length of the river itself, the total area of the drainage, uh, the drainage area of the river system, some general geographic description, where it is, what continents on, what countries it runs through, the major biomes, the major cities, what body of water it drains into, etc. Perhaps the average discharge of the river, which is a rate, right, like uh, miles per hour, meters per second. Um, meters per hour, whatever. Um, and then some interesting facts or characteristics. What's the median depth? What lives in the river? What is the shape of the river? Etc. What's What's interesting about this river drainage system? So just create a short PowerPoint um, presentation, maybe like five slides. You can be creative in your group and then you'll be responsible for presenting it either in a recorded video or next time in class. And I will answer more about this uh, when we meet tomorrow on the Zoom. I want to talk a little bit more about the continental divide that runs through the Chicago area. So as I mentioned, there is a divide that separates two major drainage basins that runs right through the Chicago area. So the continental divide is right here. It's very difficult to see, but it kind of runs like this. Okay, so it goes like that. You can follow the mouse. Everything to the west of that is going to drain out here into the, uh, into the Mississippi, ultimately, drainage basin. And then everything that falls to the east of it, so the city of Chicago mostly, would drain into Lake Michigan, which is right here. And then that would ultimately find its way out to the St. Lawrence River, go over Niagara Falls, and down into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. These two drainage basins, while they are separated by a, a small continental divide, a hill, I'll show you it in class tomorrow. You can, there's like Oak Park, the town of Oak Park has a website for the, for the continental divide because it runs through kind of Oak Park right here. Um, a feature of it, however, is that there is a part of this continental divide that is so minor, such a small uh, hill, that uh, long before this area was colonized and urbanized by, um, by European colonizers and settlers, um, there was what was known as a Chicago portage, which connected the drainage basin to the west and the drainage basin to the east. And the Chicago portage, which historically was in this area, right, so this is a zoomed in map of just Cook County, and you can see here's the Continental Divide, right? I have some more maps to show. Um, connecting the west to the east was a swampy region known as the Chicago Portage. So how did the Chicago Portage form? A long time ago, like 10,000 years ago, Lake Chicago um, formed as the ice uh, 
there was a large ice sheet covering North America during the Ice Age, and as it was retreating, it started melting, and it formed a small lake, which is now the city of Chicago. And that lake emptied out into the Des Plaines River. So this is all currently Chicago and the Chicago South Suburbs. Um, at the time, it was covered in lake. So it had a shoreline which was marked by the Valparaiso Moraine, which later became the Continental Divide, which separated the Great Lakes Basin from the Mississippi Basin. So that kind of edge of that Lake Chicago became the Continental Divide. So this is that Continental Divide right here. You can kind of see it very clearly, stretching from north to south, um, kind of through Oak Park. So here's the Continental Divide. Okay, and, and this is an older map, the Chicago River, which emptied into Lake Michigan and uh, kind of bridging the natural drainage divide, the, the Continental Divide, was the Chicago Portage. And the Chicago Portage is a kind of swampy mud lake that indigenous um, people who lived here in this, in this area um, could cross... Uh, in boats when it was very wet. And if it wasn't very wet, um, they could carry their boats across the portage and that would connect from the Des Plaines River, which ultimately you could travel down to get to the Mississippi River, to the Chicago River, which went out into Lake Michigan, and then you could sail into Lake Michigan out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So you could see that the Chicago portage was hugely important for trade um, for indigenous people who were living here before colonization. Um, they would use it to take uh, goods and other things that they were trading from uh, sort of Lake Michigan and this Great Lakes system across the divide into the Des Plaines River into the Mississippi River system where they could then travel down the Mississippi and trade with, with um, communities living in that area. So this was a hugely important um, point of trade. Unfortunately... Um, when colonizers came to Chicago, they also realized that this area was important for trade. They um, learned of the Chicago Portage um, from the indigenous folks that were living here and decided that this would be a good place to build a city, um, a, a, uh, which later became Chicago, uh, the city of Chicago. And they realized in Chicago, early on in Chicago's sort of history that because Chicago was mostly situated to the east of the Continental Divide and water ran east down the Chicago River into Lake Michigan, all of the waste from the city of Chicago was running into Lake Michigan where it was just sitting. So it was actually, you know, really gross. Lots of sludge and feces and industrial waste running down the Chicago River and sitting here on the Lake Michigan shoreline. So what they did is they re-engineered the Chicago River by building the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, which basically was a man-made Chicago portage. So they basically bulldozed through the Chicago portage, built a canal, a shipping canal, a big kind of man-made river that connected the Des Plaines River with the Chicago River. So what the Chicago Portage was doing before via a swamp, colonizers and other folks who moved to Chicago uh, built this shipping canal uh, to connect the two. And they reversed the flow of the Chicago River. So instead of waste flowing down uh, east of the Continental Divide into Lake Michigan, waste that now flowed down the Chicago sh Sanitary and Ship Canal over the Continental Divide into the Des Plaines River and ultimately into the Mississippi River. So Chicago, instead of dumping its waste via waterway into Lake Michigan, is now, and has been for over 100 years, sending it to the Mississippi River where it was making its way through places like St. Louis, New Orleans, etc. So Chicago waste water um, is no longer naturally emptying via the Continental Divide into Lake Michigan. Instead, it is being redirected uh, in the reverse direction down the Chicago Sanitary Ship Canal into the Des Plaines uh, River. This is a problem because it's connecting two drainage basins that should not be connected. 
Um, this is introducing ecosystem problems, namely invasive species of fish and, um, and plant life, um, which threaten to destroy the ecosystems of both the Mississippi River drainage system and the Great Lakes drainage system. So this is a huge ecological disaster and there have been and there continue to be um, a lot of proposals on how to sort of quote unquote fix this problem. Um, but it is not as straightforward as you think. Um, there is a PDF called the Old Chicago Portage, which I am going to post to the um, Google Drive folder, which you will be reading and we will be discussing um, uh, virtually uh, via the Discord. And I'll, I'll give you instructions on that again tomorrow as well. Okay, so we're going to move on now from rivers, um, and we're going to talk about groundwater. Because groundwater is an, also a hugely important source of water for humans on the planet. Um, it has been for a really long time, and um, is as threatened as a lot of these river drainage systems are threatened. So groundwater, what is groundwater? Groundwater is all of the water that is contained in the spaces of bedrock and soil under the ground. Um, it's estimated that groundwater makes up 30% of all fresh water, all the fresh water on the earth, and it is an incredibly important source of water for society. Some of the ways that we refer to groundwater, we typically think of groundwater via its permeability and its porosity. So permeability is a measure of how easily a solid allows a fluid to pass through it, right? So how many open spaces there are. Um, and porosity is the percentage of rock um, that is open space, right? Meaning, uh, is there room for the water to flow uh, through that, through, through the rock? So here's an example of a high permeability, high porosity um, groundwater bedrock system. So you can see that there are large spaces between the rocks, but they're not too large. So the water can still flow freely, um, quickly. Um, it can move through quickly. It can move through at all. Um, so it has high permeability and high porosity. Here's an example of a... Um, um, of a bedrock groundwater system with low porosity, meaning there's not a lot of spaces between the little molecules of dirt to allow the water to flow. And then finally, you can have too high of porosity, where the space between the rocks is very high, very large, and this is results in low permeability, permeability, meaning the water doesn't flow quickly through this space. Okay, so it has a very high porosity, but a pretty low permeability. We also talk about groundwater using terms like recharge and discharge. So um, these are important because humans are, of course, tampering with the groundwater system and situation um, on the planet. And so we need to understand what recharge and discharge are. So recharge is how the groundwater is replenished through rainfall and snowmelt infiltration. And then discharge is how that groundwater leaves the system via streams and lakes or the ocean or, or underground springs, right, where it'll come up from under the ground to a spring or it'll make its way from under the ground into a river. So this is how, excuse me, this is how groundwater is discharged and recharged, okay? So recharge you can think of like adding to the groundwater, discharge you can think of like taking away from the groundwater. And the time required for recharge and discharge varies with the flow path, with the porosity, and with the depth. So if you're very deep, it may take millennia for the, ground, for the groundwater to recharge and then discharge. If you're close to the surface, it may take days. It rains and then it discharges very quickly. Recharge and discharge and the depth of the water table can also vary with things like elevation, climate and dry or wet years or dry and wet seasons, right? So if your groundwater um, is, uh, if, your, if your terrain is mountainous, then your groundwater may be closer to the surface, okay, when it's in a valley, meaning you have a stream or maybe you have a lake, so maybe the groundwater is right at the surface, right? 
and meets up with a lake. Or at the top of the mountain, perhaps the groundwater is very far away from the surface, right? Because the, the, the water table is a little lower in relation to the sort of hill or mountain. During a climate, like for example, during a dry, dry season or a dry year, the groundwater table may drop a little because things are drying out, there's more discharge than there is recharge, and so your water table drops. During a wet year, perhaps your water table um, rises. So when we're thinking about human consumption then of the groundwater, we're talking about aquifers. Aquifers are groundwater or bodies of rock or regoliths, weathered rock, which are permeable and porous enough to conduct economically significant quantities of groundwater to springs or wells. So aquifers are just groundwater that we can use um, to drink or irrigate. So uh, there are two main types of aquifers. There's unconfined aquifers, which have a top but no bottom, right? Or sorry, a top um, and then a, an impermeable bottom. So that, sorry, let me say that again. They have no top and an impermeable bottom, bottom, meaning water can recharge into the groundwater system from anywhere on the surface, can filter down into the groundwater, but then it can't go lower than a certain level. That would be the bottom, the impermeable surface. So here, for example, is an unconfined aquifer. It's raining, it's raining, it's raining. It goes through the zone of aeration, it kind of sinks down, and then it gets into the, into the groundwater, okay? But then it can't go any lower than this graph because it's reached an imperme impermeable bottom. These are where we might put wells to get that groundwater out in an unconfined aquifer, right? So if you have a shallower well, then that well is going to go dry during the dry season, but it might be cheaper to build, for example. Or if you have a really deep producing well, then that may continue to supply water even during droughts or dry seasons. Okay, we also have confined or artesian aquifers, um, which are slightly different than an unconfined aquifer, so they have an impermeable bottom, but they also have an impermeable top for most of the way, except for a small region where the groundwater meets the surface and there's a small recharge area. So for example, in this confined aquifer, you can see that this is the bottom impermeable surface. This is the top impermeable surface. So the groundwater is contained in between and is recharged from a very small area on the surface here. So water falling in here, it's going to recharge this aquifer. So typically, um, oops, these uh, confined aquifers, if, they, if the pressure from both sides is enough to kind of force the water out on its own with very little um, pumping necessary, we call that an artesian aquifer. Meaning all you have to do is put a well in and the water kind of spurts out because it's pressurized. Okay, so, and it will kind of go up the well, and then you can pull it out with a bucket. Um, that's an artesian well, or an artesian aquifer, right? Um, that, historically, is how humans extracted groundwater. We now can pump it, so we can get it out of even aquifers that aren't um, artesian aquifers. So let me talk about a groundwater system that is very threatened. Um, many groundwater systems across the globe are threatened by human activity, but one in particular that is um, deeply and gravely threatened is the Central Valley groundwater system in the Central Valley of California. So the Central Valley of California sits kind of um, in the middle of the state between the coastal mountains and the large Sierra Nevada mountains, um, which are on the eastern side of um, the state of California, kind of forming almost uh, close to the border between Nevada. Um, and in between, there is a low region of really rich soil um, and a large, both confined and unconfined, aquifer system um, in, the, in the Central Valley, uh, which is fed by water that flows down the Sierra Nevada and water that flows down the coastal ranges, kind of collects in this close to sea level um, Central Valley 
drainage area. Um, and a long time ago, humans uh, figured out that this would be a really good place to farm and have, have been farming there for a long time. Um, now, commercial farming is it takes place in the Central Valley, and m much of the fruit and vegetables that you consume um, are grown in the Central Valley of California. But because of this extensive farming in the Central Valley, um, there's not enough natural water flowing out of the Sierra Nevada through rivers and stuff uh, to properly irrigate all of the farms that exist in Central Valley. And so water is being extracted from these unconfined and confined aquifer systems to irrigate the crops which are grown in the Central Valley, like, like um, everything from al almond trees to garlic to um, lettuces and fruit trees and um, ma many of the fruits and vegetables that you get fresh at the grocery store are grown in California. Lemons, oranges, grapes, etc. Um, and to irrigate all of those crops, they need to draw water from the groundwater system. Unfortunately, they have been drawing water out of the groundwater system for many years, and this has resulted in an, a dramatic loss of groundwater um, over the past many decades. So here's a, a graph showing the change in groundwater storage um, beginning in the year 1962 um, at zero, right? So if we consider 1962 as the baseline um, through 2003, you can see that the loss of groundwater has been, uh, was between 1962 and 2003, about 60 million acre feet of groundwater was pumped out of the um, Central Valley aquifer system and not replaced. So this was an excess discharge, we call it, which was created entirely by humans. This is not a natural discharge. We actually drew that groundwater out. You can see that the recharge during wet years did bring some of that groundwater back, but the recharge wasn't enough to counteract the extreme discharge that humans were doing through pumping of that groundwater for irrigation. Okay. It seems that most of that uh, discharge, that excess discharge, was happening in the Tulare Basin of the, um, of the groundwater system, which is um, slightly further, uh, further north. And <clears throat> um, this has led to a number of problems uh, which we consider dangerous to overpumping groundwater, right? So this loss of water is not only bad because we're losing water uh, and we're overpumping and we're not replacing it, and so we're running out of groundwater and we don't know when we'll run out because we don't actually know how much is there. We can't measure it. It also creates a really big problem known as land subsidence or land subsidence. This is a result, direct result of the removal of groundwater. So if you've got a surface and then you've got your groundwater underneath, when you pump that groundwater out and you keep pumping it out and you don't reach, uh, recharge it, you don't replace it, right, the ground starts to sink. And this is known as land subsidence. And the sinking can be really dramatic. And the sinking is not only bad because, um, you know, we're changing the geography, it's also bad because it can lead to a lot of problems, right, with um, things on the surface. You can, uh, you know, it can induce, like, earthquakes. It can um, change the, the direction of rivers. It can ruin crops. And it can cause all kinds of problems. So land subsidence is bad. And then some of these, so a, a result of the combination of the two, right, overpumping and land subsidence, as that land is subsiding, it's also getting compacted together, right, as it's sinking down, because that once porous and permeable groundwater aquifer, as it's losing its water and the land is subsiding, it's getting crushed, it's getting less and less porous, meaning that groundwater, even if it were to rain a ton and recharge all of that groundwater, it would have nowhere to go, because it's compacted, you've crushed, crushed it, you've reduced the porosity, and it cannot fit anymore. So it's so what you end up with is permanently lost water from that groundwater system. 
So we we put a satellite up in space at NASA. Um, it's frozen. Oh, there we go. So we put a satellite up in space, uh, which indirectly measures the amount of uh, groundwater. And we launched it in 2003, uh, 2002 actually, but started taking data in 2003. And so we can look at the trend, for example, from 2003 to 2013, for the Central Valley of California, all of the reds indicate loss of groundwater. And you can see that throughout much of the Central Valley here, basin, okay, the loss in groundwater has been extreme in the 10-year in the period between 2003 and 2013. Perhaps more extreme than the period we're looking at from 1962 to 2003. Period from 2003 to 2013 saw quite a substantial, right, so if we're looking from here to the end, right, so it's about 60 million acre feet loss between 1962 and 2003, and then another fully 20 million acre feet loss just in the 10 years between 2003 and 2013. So it's possible that some of this um, excess discharge through pumping is accelerating. This is happening in other groundwater systems around the world, um, not just the Central Valley, which is pictured here on the top, but also in the Euphrates River in uh, the, the sort of uh, Middle East, and then also in um, the Ganges uh, groundwater aquifer system in uh, northern India and eastern Pakistan. So we are not being responsible with our groundwater, not at all. We're removing groundwater more quickly than it's being replaced, so the discharge is higher than the recharge. This is not sustainable. Um, as we remove this groundwater, the subsidence that is resulting from this groundwater removal um, causes compaction of the remaining rock and sediment, right? It's getting crushed down. And here's a, a fascinating picture of a man in the central uh, center of the Central Valley of the San Joaquin Valley, um, standing next to a light post. And on this light post are years. That's where the ground actually was. So in 1925, the level, the surface of the ground was up here. By 1977, it was all the way down here. Okay, so you can see there has been significant land subsidence there was significant land subsidence in the 52 years between 1925 and 1977 in the middle of the Central Valley. So this compaction and this subsidence destroys the porosity. It's too crushed. There's no way, there's no room for the groundwater to fit. And so therefore, even if we wanted to replace the groundwater, we couldn't because there's no room for it. The porosity is too low now to fix this. So it's that groundwater is permanently lost. And if we continue to do this, we're going to permanently lose the whole aquifer, and not just this aquifer, but many aquifers around the globe. Um, so this is a huge problem. Our, our, our unsustainable removal of groundwater is um, a huge threat, not only to sort of human survival um, through, you know, we consuming the water, but also through growing crops um, and irrigating our crops and, and vegetables and fruits that we eat, um, that we need to eat, um, the, the sustainability of those farms is threatened by our unsustainable removal of groundwater. There's also a problem when aquifers are close to the ocean. So when aquifers are really close to the ocean, if you remove too much groundwater, right, then that water is going to go away. That fresh groundwater is going to go away, but because you're so close to the ocean, you're going to get some of that ocean water that can leak into the groundwater system. Now there's all this extra space because you took all this other water out. And so this is called saltwater intrusion. So near the coast, the removal of groundwater can cause saltwater intrusion, which ultimately poisons the aquifer. We can't drink salt water. We can only drink fresh water. So one of the solutions to this, which they're actually doing in the county, Orange County, where I, I did my PhD, just south of Los Angeles, is they in, uh, build these seawater barrier injection wells where they re-inject used water, right? Maybe you flush it down your toilet or um, 
you know, it, it ran through your, your dishwasher or down the drain of your sink um, or runoff from your irrigation and your farm or your lawn, that wastewater is collected and then re-injected into the aquifer where it will naturally be cleaned by the minerals and other things in that um, aquifer. What that also does is it puts the water back in so that the salt water doesn't come and intrude, right? So here you have the groundwater, here you're removing it, the salt water is intruding, now you in install the seawater barrier injection well, you put it in, and that pushes the salt water intrusion back. Here is a depiction of how they're doing it in Orange County. You have a couple unconfined, or sorry, you have a couple confined aquifers here where the seawater is starting to intrude. You have the desired seawater holding point. You have these injection wells, which were built actually very close to um, the campus where I did my PhD. And then you have your production wells. You're actually drawing the clean groundwater back up out of the aquifer and drinking it or using it for, for irrigation or other things. We also have a small aquifer here in Chicago. We get most of our fresh water from Lake Michigan. But we do get some of our water from the groundwater. And due to a combination of the redirection of the Chicago River, the weight actually of Chicago, the city on top of the ground, and some of our removal of the groundwater, this, our um, aquifer here in Chicago is also threatened um, by, by declining water levels where you can see that um, the decline between 1864 um, and 1980 for the Chicago area aquifer was pretty extreme, especially south and west of the downtown area of the city. So fresh water, we've talked about a lot today, is a, is a hugely and important resource for humans, but the quality and the quantity of our freshwater supplies around the world are under threat um, by groundwater overpumping, by changes to um, river, river drainage basins, um, uh, whether it's through the reversal of the Chicago River, like here um, in, in the Midwest, or if it's through um, redirection of rivers by building these, uh, these aqueducts, right, like they have in California, where they take water literally out of the river, out of the Colorado River, or out of the Sierra Nevada, and they, they create this fake river, basically, and they take that water through the aqueduct straight to, for example, the city of LA, or, or San Francisco, or Phoenix, or um, Las Vegas. Um, that we're manipulating drainage basins in that way as well. Um, so when I look at a map of where the most usable, oops, let me move over here, where the most usable water is on Earth, it's where you would expect. It's in the places where it rains a lot. So here on the eastern coast of the eastern seaboard of the United States, or the the western coast here by Seattle up up towards Alaska, or the Amazon River Basin, or the Amazon Forest and the and the Congo River Basin and the Congo Rainforest, and southeast and south uh, southeast and equatorial Asia and and uh, western Asia and the islands of J Japan and um, uh, northern Europe as well have quite a bit of usable water. Right, it rains a lot. There's a lot of water. Um, for humans to use. There's not a lot of water in the places where there are deserts, like the Sierra Desert, or Saudi Arabia, for example, or the American West, um, or Central and uh, Northwestern China. Um, these areas are very arid, arid uh, Australia, and don't have a lot of usable water. So, so um, humans in those areas have had to get quote-unquote creative to find ways to, to have water to, to, to drink and also to irrigate their crops. Unfortunately, um, some of these areas still don't have adequate fresh water availability for people that live there, um, and that's because they don't have uh, the proper um, purification systems, and so we call that economic water scarcity, where the water is there, but it's not safe to drink um, because of economic difficulties in, in purifying it. So much of Africa, for example, um, and a lot of South Asia, and even um, uh, Western South America, um, while there's a lot of uh, water, usable water that falls in those areas, there's a lot of economic water scarcity because that water isn't um, always drinkable. It's not, it's not safe to drink. Um, 
So that's economic water scarcity. There's also physical water scarcity, which is typically in deserts and regions um, surrounding deserts. And so if you look at these maps up here, these maps are scary. This is a map from 1995, and this is an estimated map of 2025, looking at the each country's um, water withdrawal, so how much water they're drawing out either from their groundwater or from uh, lakes and rivers, as a percentage of the total available water. So you can see that in, for example, North Africa and the Middle East and Southwest Asia, um, more than 40% in some of these countries of the total available water is being withdrawn uh, to for irrigation and for drinking. Um, by humans. That's a lot of water. That's almost half of all the available water. So if you have a 10-year drought, for example, you're fucked. Um, fast forward to 2025, and you can see that the countries that are shaded in the, in the darker brown here expands to include India and Egypt uh, and North Africa and South Africa, and the United States even here falls in the 40 to 20 to 40 percent range where it starts to become a problem. So uh, water withdrawals are going up as population increases and as we continue to increasingly grow more crops in what I would argue are the, the wrong areas. And we're going to talk a lot about farming as, as part of uh, sort of the earth system and the, the what we call the Anthropocene in a couple of lectures down the road. Um, but economic scarcity, increasing physical scarcity, um, really threaten access to clean water um, across the globe. So here's a map showing uh, countries where this one here says access to an improved water source in percentage of total population. So in, in a lot of Africa, for example, less than 65% um, of the population. So, um, you know, uh, it's quite a bit of people, if it's le only less than 65%, um, has uh, access to an improved water source, okay? And access to safe water in some of these countries and regions uh, where economic scarcity of water is highest is approaching 50%, okay? Where you have uh, clean, global clean water supply, clean water supply, sorry, as a percentage of the population. It's very low, very low percentage. Uh, for example, in Afghanistan, it's only 29%. Uh, clean water as a percentage of population. So this is a problem. It's not just physical availability of water, it's also economic availability of water, economic scarcity of water um, is a really big problem. Returning to groundwater, another really big problem with groundwater, something that threatens humans' access to fresh water, is contamination, whether it be through gas um, or oil or septic um, or salt, uh, getting into that aquifer, other waste, landfill and animal sewage, for example, and waste injection wells, the aquifers can become contaminated. When they become contaminated, they become unusable. So what scarce water we do have available, what scarce fresh water we do have available on the Earth's surface is not only being threatened by over-discharging it, withdrawing too much, by economic scarcity, by by increasing physical scarcity from climate change, which we haven't even started to talk about, but also a lot of it's being contaminated. Okay, so our access to water is a problem. It's, it's, it's becoming increasingly more dire. It's a situation that deserves a lot of attention and care, um, and it's going to be a huge problem going forward in the future. Okay, so thinking about water as a part of the earth system, okay, it's, it's, it's critical to the survival of humans, whether it be our um, cities uh, and, and settlements evolving along the coasts, coastlines of rivers, um, the Amazon River, right, for example, or the, or the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers in the, in, uh, um, the Middle East, um, or the fresh water that we use for drinking, for doing the things that we need to do, making clothing, irrigating our crops, um, all the multiple things, multitude of things that we do with water, these things are threatened by increasing scarcity, whether it be physical scarcity because we're withdrawing too much groundwater or too much water from lakes and rivers, or economic water scarcity because we don't have access to clean, safe water to drink and irrigate with, 
right, or contaminated groundwater. All of these things present a problem as we look forward into the future, and that's not even considering the direct effects of climate change, which we're going to talk about more towards the second half of this course. So I'm sorry for the really depressing end to this lecture, but this is our introduction to the hydrosphere, the component of Earth's system that is all the water on Earth, whether it be liquid, ice, or as a water vapor. All right, I'm going to end here.